Hare Krishna Yogeshwar Prabhu, humble obeisances. Thank you very much for Hare joining Krishna, once again Chitana. for the Monks Podcast. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. You know, today I thought we could discuss on the topic of Western culture. You know, broadly speaking, in India, at least, in India itself, you can see there are two very rapid, two very widely diverging attitudes. On one side, there is much of India that is enamored with the West. On the other side, there is a lot of criticism of the West because the Western culture is eroding Indian values, Indian culture, Indian spirituality. And that, that rhetoric is also very strongly there within, within our movement. In fact, uh, in fact, that is one of the, you could say, rallying cries for taking up to spirituality and protecting, protecting Indian culture, Indian values, Indian spirituality. So while the, both these approaches are there, and ever since I actually started going abroad, I think 2014 was the first year I, I went abroad. And since then I've been going, going to, um, I was going almost, before COVID started, almost eight, nine months a year outside India. So I got to observe things which have nuanced my perspectives also. But I thought broadly we would take this, this topic of, you know, how to have a view of Western culture that is both faithful to our tradition. At the same time, it is also, you could say, realistic with respect to today's world and also compassionate toward those who are in, in today's world. So that was the background. Uh, what, you can share your thoughts and then you can take it forward from there. Well, I mean, I, I agree with your uh, introduction here. Um, I, yeah, at the same time, I find myself hesitating to call spirituality Indian or Eastern or Western. I think part of uh, what Prabhupada uh, came to do was to erase those kinds of um, material distinctions. Uh, there's a risk in uh, bifurcating uh, a culture, bifurcating a, a progressive civilization into Eastern or Western, um, as if the, the, the rules uh, or the truths are different depending on where you come from. And um, so the first thing I would say is that um, I think it's unfortunate that because we live in very uh, tense times, I mean, I, I can't tell you uh, how much heartache I feel when I read the, the kind of bitterness and, and cruelty and violence that's, that just seems to be growing all the time. The reports are just, they're spiraling out of control. Mm. So much anger and hostility uh, partisanship, you know, it's just, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a New Yorker. Okay? I grew up in New York. And uh, I'll admit I might have been a little bit sheltered, you know, I, and I, my experience is not, you can't make a universal American experience for growing up in the 1950s, 1960s. There are individual men and women and children who had their own particular experiences. But at least for me, I remember a time when we used to keep our doors open. I lived in an apartment building. And um, yeah, people were friends, you know, and, and uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, we were friends. We'd sit down and have dinner together. We'd, we'd, you know, their children would go to the same schools or the same places of worship. They'd have picnics or whatever. They'd go on vacations. There wasn't the kind of... Uh, um, polarized uh, bitterness and hostility that we're seeing today. So, so things have definitely deteriorated. I mean, we're, <laughs> Kali, Kali, Yuga, Kali Yuga is doing a great job. You know, all of the predictions in Bhagavatam are coming true. Um, so we want to be sure that we don't add to the hostilities by uh, ascribing spiritual culture to to one uh, uh, ethnic or national background 
you know, bhakti, you find bhakti in every world culture. You find bhakti in, 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 in the Christian mystic traditions. You find bhakti in Islamic Sufism. You find bhakti in the uh, Kabbalah traditions of Judaism. You know, the, the, the notion of devotion to the Supreme Being is not Indian or American or th that's universal. So that's where we're going. That's where we're striving for that. Um, you know, just uh, to echo, sorry to interrupt, just to echo this point, you know, I had thought of a provocative title for this talk that is Western culture materialistic and is Indian culture spiritual? So, mm -hmm. I mean, many, <laughs> many Indians would find that provocative. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, in, in, in France, there's a saying, bonnet blanc or blanc bonnet? Is, is your hat white or is, is that white thing on your head a hat? <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> clear. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, look, we, I don't think we should call it Western civilization. You know, it's not civilized. You, mean, you want to call it Western barbarity, you know, Western, you know, tragedy, you know, fine. Um, and look, you know what I like? I like what Gandhi said about it. Somebody asked him, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, well, at the time, I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <it's> a... <clears throat> now, I was talking with one uh, senior Prabhupada disciple about this, and he made this very striking point that actually, when Prabhupada came to America, probably he experienced the worst of Western culture in one mm -hmm. sense that the counterculture period was quite uh, radical. And of course, we could say as compared to 1960s things may have gone further south since then. But he said that what would be called as what, what, what traditionally held the West together, like America was founded to a significant extent, uh, extent on Protestant values. And the original Americans who came were quite Protestant and America is even today considered to be among the Western world's most religious countries. Now we could always define religion in various ways. But what you said about Western culture, uh, Western civilization, I think that also is a relatively recent phenomena. Maybe before the before Freud, Freudian revolution or sexual revolution, there was a lot of spirituality even in the mainstream Western society. Isn't it? Well, you know, America was founded by people fleeing religious oppression in England. And uh, you know their original initial idea was let's let's find a place of our own where we can um, build a culture founded on on rational thinking, on a sense of the dignity of uh, of all life. Of course, the first thing they did was to steal the land away from the Native Americans. So we're not going to go there. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that um, that was the initial impetus for America. But I think you have to go back. You know, you can get back, go back uh, 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 to other roots as well. You know, uh, if you look at um, the foundations of, uh, of, uh, of economic theory, for example, you know, going back to Adam Smith in the 1700s and then uh, John Stuart Mill in the 1800s and then John Maynard Keynes moving into the 20th century, it, it the, the basis of the economic foundation of what we're calling Western civilization was the notion that people make best choices for themselves and that the best system of society, of government, therefore, is one where everyone is employed, everyone has a working uh, vocation, uh, and people can follow their own self-interests so long as they don't step on anybody's toes. You know, life is for for uh, pleasure and for self-fulfillment and, you know, just regulate it, you know, make it, give it a structure. So the idea of Western civilization initially was a society based on effective labor and reward and, and something that allows to people to pursue their best interests. 
But here's the problem. If you don't know who you are, how do you know what your best interests are? Mm. So there, along with the, 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 somewhere along the line, this antipathy occurred between what is traditionally called religion and what may be called secular or rational society. And um, religion was relegated to uh, churches and synagogues and mosques and places of faith. And, and um, the structure of society became, uh, um, at least in America and other Western nations, non-theistic. You know, it needed to be a neutral platform where everyone could express their particular faith in their own way. Now you go to some of the more traditional Middle Eastern nations and, and that's not the case. Um, but the idea basically, basically was let's create an environment, a, a Western civilization as you and I are calling it, where uh, everyone can make their own choices um, based on their personal preferences, as long as they respect the rules. That, 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 that was the basic idea. Along the way, something happened. When, when, you know, when, when, you, when you polarize interests like that, eventually they're going to become uh, in conflict with one another. You know, we, we often distinguish, for example, between, I guess you might say, personal fulfillment and happiness on the one hand, and, and, and work and career, on the other hand, as though these two things were separate. You know, but they're not separate. You know, a contented life is not something that you turn on and off like a faucet. You know? But what we're calling, what you and I are calling Western civilization, has artificially separated the different sides sides of life so that's fascinating so you are not uh, generally the vision of western civilization that is criticized is that there is a lot of ethical degradation so you are tracing that ethical degradation uh, more to the separation of religion and rationality by which the intellectual impetus for following ethics was no longer there. Is that how, I mean, was that your flow of thought or? I, I don't think, I don't think it was a sacrifice of ethics. I think ethics has always been part of the consideration in, in the forming of, uh, of nations, at least civilized nations as we were calling them. Um, it was more a sense of how do you create a neutral environment, a level playing field where everyone can pursue their particular interests or faiths um, and, and where it's not a dictatorship that insists that this is how you will believe, this is how you will act. That was the initial impetus. But so it's not a question of, of, of bad agents, of people necessarily acting out of some malicious intent. It, it's the nature of the exercise. When you try to separate the interests, see this. What Prabhupada did was so revolutionary because his proposition was that you can have a a more God-centered culture or civilization without stepping on people's toes. That there is a way to create an environment where there's freedom of flexibility, there's still freedom of choice, but the government is informed. You know, the, the government knows how to um, provide the basic structures that will allow people to pursue their core interests. Now, that's, the, that's where the challenge came in. The, the, the notion of core interests, the, the definition of what it means to be a human being became radically different. They were, they, it was no longer the, the kind of pre-modern cultures where an appreciation for the mystery of the universe was universal. I mean, 
you can still see it reflected. For example, I know when I first went to India, I was amazed. I would take, this was back in the 1970s, and I would take a taxi somewhere. Everybody knew Krishna. Everybody knew we're not these bodies, we're eternal soul. There was a, a basic understanding of certain fundamental truths. All of that got sacrificed along the way when that, I'm going to call it pre-modern, notion of the dignity of life, the sanctity of life, the, the eternality of all beings was sacrificed on the altar of economic progress. I mean, that's my premise here. My premise is that what we're calling Western civilization is a phenomenon predicated on economic progress. I mean, Marx, Marx, Marx understood this perfectly. Marx understood that, be careful here, be careful. As long as you define the fulfillment of a human being as economic progress, then you put the power in the hands of the, the owners of the means of production, and they will not be able to resist exploiting their workers because that's human nature. He, he really, he, he nailed it. I, he had other things wrong, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, he had this a rather utopian view of what humans were would be capable of doing if, if there was a classless society and so on that that would that didn't prove out to be very very accurate but you know you have to uh, study history if we're going to understand how we got to where we are in the world today you have to study history and you and i talked about this last time it began with the, the you know, first the renaissance you know when when Humankind began turning its eyes toward the greater universe and applying our imagination to understanding from an empiric, rational, logical perspective, how does the universe operate? And then it led to the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment was with this intensification of scientific inquiry and the beginnings of, of technological you know, evolutions. And, and with the refinement and the acceleration of technology, now you've got stuff, you know? Science is so convincing because it has technology to create stuff, you know, what, and, and that stuff gives you uh, uh, the impression of a more satisfactory, pleasurable life. You know, you've got fancy cars, you've got washers and dryers, you've got electronic equipment, you've got all these things. That's all thanks to science. What has religion and philosophy ever given us that has improved the uh, the the the, you know, the the fate of mankind, nothing but heartache and warfare and strife and divisiveness. Okay? So you have to go back to the roots to understand the 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 dilemma that you posed at the beginning of this discussion. You know, is you know Western civilization good or bad? Right? So so some of that background is helpful in our discussion. Here. Okay, maybe then I'm just trying to. Put the pieces together. Maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, say, from an Indian perspective, because a significant part portion of our audience is Indians, either Indians who are based in India or Indians who are based abroad. So when when we talk about uh, the Western culture, one of the biggest matters of concern, or uh, you could say, two three things are related is the breakdown of the family, the loosening of, uh, you could say, say if sexual restraints, which are all related. And the third is the turning away from, turning away from God and traditional religious practices. So, and in general, much of this is what is associated with Westernization. Say, so means when Indians think about Western culture, I mean, if we hear a typical class criticizing Western culture, that's what it is centrally about. So it's basically the disruption of the family structure, say, the, as the, these three things. Now, what, where you are coming from is that uh, maybe we could start with what is what was positive or good about the Western, the way the Western civilization emerged or what were the ideals on which it began. Oh, that, my that, goodness. That's... So, is that that's where you're coming from? Sure. Yeah. So no, that's, 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 
that's where I think you are coming from, where you are saying that the idea of uh, a socio political environment where people are allowed to pursue their interests. Yeah, look, and, don't condemn, don't condemn Western civilization. That's a big mistake. Yes. That's a yes. big mistake. You know, that is just uh, to to complement this point. You know, I met a friend in, I met a influential Indian in America. And he is now trying to rediscover Indian spirituality. And he told me his story. And he said that he was born in a lower caste in India. And he couldn't even go to schools. He was brilliant at math. But he was, so his, his math teacher invited him to his home you know, to have food with him. But because he was from a lower caste, he couldn't even come to, they came, he came to the house, but he didn't eat on the same table. They offered him food separately. And he said, I was always looked down upon although I was good at math. And then finally he got a scholarship. He came to America. I was brilliant. And it was not now with thousands of students from India going to America in the 1970s. But it was rare. So he said when he came to America, his PhD guide came to receive him at the airport. And he said, I was completely stunned by that. He says, this is something which is unimaginable in India. And I realized it's a very different kind of, different kind of operational values. So, so, you know, so that is one thing which is, uh, which was also, you know, I realized this more after I started traveling abroad and actually interacting with people. So in terms of, at least in principle, accepting the intrinsic equality of people and respecting their, say, intrinsic self-worth. And then, as you said, giving them the freedom to pursue uh, their self-interests. Those are things which are, usually not so much in the in the Indian mind when you think about Western culture. Well, um, you know, I think we need to be cautious here about universalizing one person's experience as, as, though, as if that typifies all experiences. For every one case of someone coming to America and their PhD, uh, advisor comes to greet them at the airport. I can give you 10 examples of people who came and immediately they were uh, 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 shunned and, 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 uh, and left feeling uh, inferior and, and uh, taken advantage of. Um, I, we have uh, a, a godbrother who is a, a PhD and a brilliant professor uh, out of the Midwest who's uh, one of the few Hindu families in his uh, town and people treat him there like dirt. He has to leave, it's so bad for him. So we have to be careful about universalizing uh, that experience. Um, th there are individual pockets and individual uh, histories here, but certainly we would not have the Krishna consciousness movement if it were not for constitutional safeguards freedom of religion, uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of assembly. Um, you know, the, the, these are all uh, legally mandated. And um, Srila Prabhupada, just months before he passed away, uh, won a critical court case in the New York State Supreme Court, where the judge, after hearing all the evidence uh, against Krishna consciousness, against ISKCON as a, as a, as a uh, um, brainwashing uh, cult, um, um, uh, uh, rendered his verdict, which was you know, the, the accusations are false. This is a valid religion with its roots going back thousands of years in India. And uh, its members have the legal right to practice their faith in America. So clearly there, there are benefits to what we're calling Western civilization. And in particular, constitutional republics where uh, human rights are recognized. Now, they're not always enforced. I mean, look at the trauma that African-Americans have to go through in this country. Black and brown people in this nation live in constant fear. I, I'm 71 years old next week, and I'm still shocked at how little I understood the depth and scale of the racism and the bias in this country.
I mean, we're living under a rock somewhere. So, you know, they don't have it right. It's not like it's going well. But in principle, in principle, we have a system that's very robust. You know, what we're calling Western civilization or what I call, what we're really talking about is the American democratic free market system of government. We're not talking about all Western civilizations. That would be an endless conversation. But I think the people you're referring to who compare India and America, that's that's really kind of the, the, the juxt the essence of, of the argument there. So the the challenge is that we're we're, we're sitting in this ethical and moral um, no man's land. Uh, where we want to give everyone freedom, but but doing so means taking the bad with the good, you know, and and we're just beginning to understand that some other mechanism, some ethical, moral, what you and I would call a spiritual mechanism, needs to be reinforced because, you know we're just going to destroy the planet, you know, in the name of equality, <laughs> you know, everyone has the right to do whatever they want. Okay. So we're going to destroy earth because everyone should have, you know, the freedom to go and do what they want to do. Yeah. So that, that compass, that moral compass is missing. And that's, I think, in a, a critical component to what Prabhupada attempted to do. He, he never envisioned success as everyone walking around in saris and dhotis. That, that was not his vision of success. So. You know, that's itself is for many a strong statement that Prabhupada didn't ex expect uh, envision success that way. But I think that's a whole different subject. But I appreciate this point. So when you use the word ethical and moral no man's land, it's a very striking phrase. So what you mean that there are values that are accepted, but, and they are taught also, but how those values are to be, uh, to be actualized in society, uh, the, there is no map for, no map for doing that. Is that what you mean by the ethical and moral no man's land? Yeah, what, what I mean is that, um, for, let's take an obvious example, right? Everyone should have the, the, the right to uh, eat whatever food they want to eat as long as they're not cannibals. Okay. okay. So that means that you can eat meat if you want to eat meat. Now that's been extended to um, anyone has the right to open up a slaughterhouse uh, as long as they follow certain regulations. And what are those regulations? Well, you have to... Uh, uh, ensure that the meat is not uh, poisonous. Okay, so to do that, people inject hormones and, and all kinds of um, uh, harmful chemicals into their uh, stocks. And, and uh, <laughs> so what people are ingesting is just as harmful uh, 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 anyway. So now we can begin tracing this back, right? You can't really have a moral and ethical compass unless you establish the non-material foundations of consciousness, that life is not the product of matter. This was the brilliance of um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings, the Goswami's teachings, the teachings of the Acharyas, Srila Prabhupada's foundational message, you are not the body. That is such a revolutionary idea. This one idea, you are not the body, is a key that can that can transform this world into heaven on earth. If this one idea were were properly understood, if that were properly understood, uh, and, and, and instead we're you know we're creating a monster. You know, it's described in the Gita and the divine and demonic natures. You know that life is produced of sex. It has a, it, it is nothing but material. There's nothing but matter in the universe. This physicalistic science thing is is, is so harmful because it, it robs people of their spiritual dignity. It says you are nothing but your body. You're nothing but physics. You're nothing but particles and wave functions. That's all you are. It's horrible. It's, it, it, you know, I try to control myself because I have a physicist in my family. But, you know, the fact is, 
is it's 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 so powerful. Again, science is so powerful because it can point to things. Look what we did. You know, look what we produced. We understand the workings of subatomic particles and that electronic watch that you're wearing, that quartz watch or the, you know, that digital watch that you're wearing, whatever. 80% of all the functions there are thanks to our discoveries about the functioning of subatomic particles and, and the behavior of electrons and so on. Your computer, this conversation we're having right now uh, by, uh, by Zoom, it's all thanks to science. Right? What has religion ever produced? Right? So that, that's, that's the basic argument. So what we have from our tradition, Mahaprabhu, the Goswamis up to the present day, Bhaktivinoda Thakur and so on, and then more recently, the work of Sadaputta and, and Bhaktivinoda of Dhamradam Maharaj and, and, and the BI and so on, is this directing our attention to the, the confluence of these ideas, that there are points of tangency here, that the, the notion of the eternality of Self, the non-material quality of consciousness, that's not a religious idea. That's the key right there to the success of Srila Prabhupada's mission. If we could grasp that, then we can begin applying it in field of you know, governance, um, poverty, uh, environment, uh, hunger, begin applying this idea to more informed uh, uh, legislative policy making not at that stage we 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 have we don't have enough people yet um, who have examined this so carefully that they're that they've learned to evolve the language that's needed for demonstrating the contribution that Gaudiya Vaishnavism can make in the larger world that's work that still lies ahead of us so where you are coming from is that the Western, what we call as Western culture was formed on certain principles where people should be given the reasonable freedom, we could say, to pursue their self-interests. And, uh, and the problem with that is, unless people really know what the self is, they can't pursue their interests in a way that is that, uh, that doesn't end up betraying or going against the very ideals that they were pursuing. Yeah. Very well said, very well said. So then you brought this point that what Prabhupada offered was uh, this wisdom by which, uh, by which uh, we could say that the spiritual aspect of life can, you could say, underlie our spiritual purpose of life can underlie all aspects of life. And that's how we can have, uh, what are the cherished values of the West? I think one of them is equality equality, liberty, you could say, these are some of the cherished values. How, if they are founded on spiritual wisdom, then all that can be fulfilled. So that's what the direction in which you are going. So have I broadly, I mean, there are a lot of nuances which we discuss also, but are we in, the, did I summarize reasonably well till now? Yes, as long as we also add that it is not Hindu. It is not Indian, it is not American. These ideas are reflected in, in the uh, best efforts of uh, uh, Indian governance, uh, American governments, European governance. There's, there, there's an intuition there. Um, but because it takes place without that greater spiritual background architecture and awareness of consciousness as non-material, it always ends up becoming divisive. It's, it, it, it's the American form of divorce, democracy versus, um, you know, Middle Eastern forms of democracy versus uh, there'll always be tension and strife and conflict as long as the, that universal foundation uh, is missing. Now, strides have been made. Strides have been made. I mean, even since World War II. We have rules of land warfare. We have uh, human rights declarations. We have... Uh, uh, laws of the sea uh, uh, conventions. You know, we we have um, uh, workplace uh, equality uh, 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 legislation. Not, all all of this is relatively recent. So there are some steps being made to achieve a more equitable playing field for for all people. 
Um, but the, the, the dimension of consciousness is still missing. Okay. So if we consider that a, a basic feature of any civilized society would be to, to say, prevent radical injustices, to, as I said, to provide an equitable level, play, playing field for everyone within, within reasonable limits. Like you said, you can eat anything, but not cannibalism. A certain absolute no's, but within that, there can be certain, there should be a reasonable amount of freedom. So, generally, the idea of, uh, okay, if, if I understand I am not the body, I am the soul, or uh, that my essence is spiritual, uh, two things. In principle, we understand that, okay, that will make us less materialistic, less, say, less craving for worldly pleasures at all costs. Mm. So in principle, that's understood. But in practice, how would this uh, be translated into any kind of uh, social policy or any kind of guidelines for society? It would be more of a matter of individual assimilation and application rather than state implementation, isn't it? Well, again, you're asking a, 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 a very, very broad question. We would need, you know, months <laughs> to explore that in depth. Uh, what what we can say is that it, it will require very, very careful study and consideration how these principles can be implemented in a way that is uh, effective and meaningful and and just fair um, in a secular environment. So that, that, that's, the, that's the tension there is that we're trying to maintain that uh, ecumenism, uh, you don't want to damage that basic core. I mean, you know, the founding fathers knew what they were doing. They had a good idea that, you know, people are basically selfish. And they need uh, rules and regulations to keep them in check. So you have, you know, the Declaration of Independence, you have the Constitution, you have the Bill of Rights. There are these um, codified documents that are basically meant to do that. Um, but how to implement it in such a way that, we're, uh, that it actually achieves that higher spiritual purpose? That's a tough one. Let's take, for example, the same example, meat eating. I, you know, I roll my eyes every time I hear someone say, we need to close down all the slaughterhouses. Like, what are you talking about? Close down? If you, if you really want to, you know, see the Krishna consciousness movement uh, lose its, uh, its nonprofit status, just, <laughs> just go about advocating those kinds of ridiculous programs, right? Now we're really living out our image as a cult. We start talking that kind of fantasy. So That's never sorry, how how is that related with this nonprofit status? You're saying we will start being seen as a cult? Yeah, because as, as soon as we start acting as a cult, instead of a dignified religion that is willing to accept that everyone has their own particular, you know, if we start insisting, is my point. This is how it's got to be done. We're going to close down the slaughterhouses. We're going to shut down all of the uh, uh, abortion clinics. We're going to, you know, you name it. You know, we're going to insist that everyone starts chanting Hare Krishna. Yeah. That, that, that kind of fanaticism is not going to get us in. But how to do it, that requires a much more nuanced understanding of what are the issues. What are the issues behind making, for example, a, a shift away from animal slaughter to some other thing that will still satisfy meat eaters? You know, there's this thing called, uh, it's not called fake meat, but it is, it's created from meat enzymes. Yes. The new, new field of um, it's development in, in protein uh, cultivating the proteins in, in laboratories so that you don't have to slaughter animals. So that's an interesting question, though, is that 
Is that something that, uh, as a devotee, I would endorse? That I'm kind of on the fence about it, but I certainly think there's an advantage to these intermediary steps. You know, excuse me for talking about my mom. Uh, she, as I, as you, as you know, because I've told you before, she passed away this past November, and I still, I still hurt. You know, I still grieve. I still miss her terribly because she was my best friend and she was super smart and very funny. And one of the last things we did before she died was watch uh, a documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, my mom was a big RBG fan. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was yeah. one of the more enlightened, enlightened members of the Supreme Court uh, uh, in the past hundred years, um, uh, in this documentary said that she had learned two things from her mother. The first thing she said was, my mother taught me never act from anger because that's just going to earn you enemies. The other thing was, don't try for big sweeping changes. Try for small incremental changes. Mm. Then you can grow it in the future. Right? That's, those are wise words right there. Those are very, very wise words. We, we need to cool our jets a little bit in Krishna consciousness. We, we learn to, we need to learn how to um, adjust our expectations so that inroads can be made rationally, realistically, and in such a manner that you can actually maybe earn, well, let's call it bipartisan support. <laughs> you know, uh, that means really understanding the issues deeply. What are the economic ramifications of changing uh, the rules of the, of the meat industry? What are the social ramifications? What are the psychological ramifications? What are the medical ramifications? You know, you got to know this stuff inside out. So it's going to take a while. Okay. So now, just taking, I appreciate this point about being slow and incremental. I think one of the leaders of Russia, the, after the communism fell, he said that communism should have first been tried in a small area instead of being tried in this vast part of the world, USSR and, uh, and China, which eventually led to huge amount of disasters. I think it was Boris Yeltsin or Gorbachev who said that. But in the same point, with respect to us, now our attempts to say implement Krishna consciousness till now, I mean... Uh, at individual level, definitely, I think thousands and thousands of devotees would say that their, the quality of their lives has improved tremendously by bringing Krishna into their lives. But at the same time, wherever we have tried to do it at a, at a level of an institutional program or a, a community, we have, uh, you know, we have had many learning experiences, some successes. So what you're saying, I think it is also the voice of experience. because. In the early years, when we start practicing bhakti, we start thinking that we just have the solutions to all problems. They chant Hare Krishna and be happy, or just understand you're not the body of the soul. But what you're saying is that uh, that's why you said earlier this point that it'll take long discussions to decide that the, the basic understanding of our spirituality, how that will be translated into into any kind of social policy or into uh, to bring about organizational change. So just uh, taking this, so did I summarize what you're saying? Or, or we can yeah, on? well, what you bring to mind is that, um, you know, we can't even get our own act together, let alone, you know, reform society. I, I'm, I'm asked to speak before temple gatherings, Sunday feasts and, and, and the youth groups and so on. And so from my own experience, I can tell you that there is so much um, there's a lot of sadness. There's a lot of disappointment. There's a lot of um, heartbreak out there um, because people have this intuition that Krishna consciousness is right. There's something good and, and wonderful here. But when they try to enact it in their lives, they're just adrift and, and uh, 
from what I'm told, many people feel that they don't have good guidance. They don't have people they can turn to. There's so much uh, antipathy and bitterness and, and um, divisiveness in temple communities. Now, I don't want to paint a picture like that as though that's all of ISKCON. I can only talk to the examples that I've been invited into, the places where I've been. I know that there are some extraordinary, wonderful projects like, you know, you're at Radhanaswamy's Eco Village or Chaupati. My goodness, things are, you know, it's, or uh, Bhaktivedanta Manor when I was there. What, it was, there. Of course, there's always problems, but there are examples of um, healthy uh, um, ISKCON and Krishna conscious projects all over the world. So I don't want to paint a picture of doom and gloom. What I'm saying is, we're, we're in a bit of a dilemma because we have global aspirations and yet a lot of the issues that stand in the way of realizing those aspirations um, are uh, being neglected. That there, there, there isn't enough, I think, effective, um, I'm going to call it pastoral care. I'm going to call it training to be good human beings you know we're i'm sorry i i it sounds like i'm criticizing and i i, I try not to but i'm gonna do it anyway what can i do um you know i roll my eyes listening to classes sometimes i don't know what people are talking about i don't know where where their heads are at you know the real important issues are being neglected so we, we've got a long way to go We've got a long way to go. I, I'm thank thank God for people like uh, Rajvihari and his son Gopinath, uh, and thank God for my son Ramamrita. Um, you know there are people out there who uh, recognize this and they're doing things. They're, they're you know there there was something called ISKCON uh, 3.0, I think, a series of discussions with ISKCON leaders and others. How we can um, what are the issues that need to be addressed? How can we address those issues? And what are the intended outcomes? So, you know, it's, it's happening. It's happening. I, and and um, what I find myself telling people more and more is don't despair. Don't, don't, don't live with sadness. And, and uh, you know, there, there's there's much goodwill. There's much good effort. There are people around you who care. There are support mechanisms that you can uh, 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 refer to. Um, so there, there's a lot, but there's the point is there's a lot of work to do on the ground floor. You know, because we before we get to these lofty aspirations, let's make sure that the foundation is strong. Yes, Phil, that's so true. You know. When you talked about that lot of work to be done inside our movement, I like the phrase ground floor itself, because uh, at one level, the foundation, if you want to say, the spiritual truths on which we are basing our lives, those foundations are strong, they're timeless. But how those foundations lead to the superstructure, I like that metaphor, what you're putting. Just now, regard uh, this point, I feel that in whatever little traveling I have done, but there are very inspired and dedicated devotees yeah. in almost every community. And there are some communities which also have very visionary leadership. And uh, there are devotees. So I would say that there are many communities also which excel in one particular area of outreach. But whether you know it's excelling in, say, temple building, excelling in food distribution, excelling in, say, youth preaching, excelling in certain areas, but presenting Krishna consciousness as a holistic program where all the needs of devotees are taken care of. And then, you know, we present Krishna consciousness as a, as a viable, viable means for exploring for people who don't yet want to be committed also. That somebody is in the mainstream society, but they can draw something from Krishna conscious, from our tradition, from the bhakti tradition, to uh, to address their concerns. I think that is very much missing. 
so that is maybe it's done to some extent at a practical humanitarian level in terms of food outreach or environment concerns slightly but uh, the intellectual contribution so let if i put it, the intellectual contribution of our movement beyond conversion into the movement there is not much work done in that and i feel that other devotees who are academically inclined they are doing something but sometimes they are hamstrung by the by the limitations of being in the academy also yes um one of the things that i love about talking with you in these podcasts is that we go far and wide <laughs> you know, we discuss so many things on so many levels. It's 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 wonderful. It's actually very uh, exhilarating to spend time with you, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. So uh, again, I'm grateful to you for uh, inviting me back as often as you do. Um, so but, I'm sorry because you know, yes. So I mean, I appreciate your point, what you're making, but I'm also sorry that we are having a very broad ranging rather than a you could say a focused discussion. But I think. Uh, maybe we are laying the foundation or laying the groundwork for a series of podcasts on various issues instead of having say diverse topics we could go deeper into uh deeper into this flow of thought overall but you know sure I, I, yeah. that's that's fine i would love to do that i i here's my response to what you just said though what prabhupad created was not one dimensional or two dimensional it was multi dimensional so you have the level of the community, let's call it uh, uh, fraternity, you know, uh, the, the community sangha, you know, people come to Krishna consciousness or they attend a class, they read a book and they explore it, they, you know, examine it. They say, okay, this makes sense to me. I like this. Um, I like the food. I like the chanting. Um, Devotees are nice people. Uh, the deities are very pretty. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try this out. So there's that kind of, call it a simple level, you know, a, a, a level of um, um, kinship with Krishna consciousness. So it becomes a kind of a lifestyle. Then there's the, the level of its application, you know, Western civilization, India versus America and so on. You know, you can explore it on, in terms of its place on a, uh, on a world stage, culturally, sociologically. Then there's uh, vocationally, people can look at how their lives integrate, how to balance you know, their material life and their spiritual life and so on. Um, then there's this other dimension, which we've begun to touch on here which is, and, and what interests me, which is where, where does this go? If you take this out, if you take this farther out, what, what would that be like? In other words, it's good to have a sense of the target. Right? It's good to have a sense of what that would look like so that as you're planning your itinerary, you know where, what your des destination is. You, you, you know where you're going. So it's not a matter of, okay, now I've accepted Krishna consciousness. Now I'm a devotee. Now I'm chanting. And, and then it stops there. It, it plateaus. That, that's, that's not what it's meant to be. Prabhupada was constantly pushing us, pushing us, pushing us all the time, all the time. And, and you have to feel comfortable with that. It, it, it's, it's not an easy thing. He didn't come... He, he, well, let me rephrase this. On one level, he came to establish something that anyone, Hindu, American, German, Irish, whoever, can have a, a happy life, a content life, you know, uh, 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 of serving Krishna and, and following certain basic principles and, you know, coming up to the mode of goodness. That, if, if, if there's anything that's consonant between that level of Krishna consciousness and what you and I are calling Western culture, is that both are gearing toward the mode of goodness. Western culture in its finest moment moves toward that light of the mode of goodness, where there is a, 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 a common ground of mutual respect for the dignity of life, or at least human life, um, some sense of uh, need to 
pay attention to the environment and so on. So there is some common ground there. But where it goes ultimately, that, that's, that's a discussion that's, that, that's needed. So, uh, so yes, I accept your invitation. Let, let's let's uh, uh, separate this thing into different topics. They're all worthy of discussion. So, you know, coming to this, so I think the, the question where we got a little caught maybe even more in ISKCON concerns was that how do we actually apply the principle that uh, the insight that our consciousness is not material in terms of uh, social, uh, social organized, social, pol social political or social cultural organization. Mm. So let's keep the specific implementation separately. But in principle, you know, how would that make a difference? In principle, say, if, say, you, you talked earlier about if a society, if we are going to, say, rate a society, maybe rate is not the right word, but maybe if, it, if uh, a desirable social order is that which provides a basic level, a level, basically a level playing field for everyone. Maybe it may not be ideally, but at least more than what is at present in most part uh, in the world and what has also been there in most of recorded human history. So in principle, how would say we could say the values of democracy or the values of individual of justice and freedom and equality, how would these values be furthered by a spiritual self-understanding? Let's focus on principles right now rather than on say, sure. yeah. Great. Well, uh, in, in principle, uh, arguably the most tangible contribution that devotees can make to that challenge of, you know, moving humanity forward toward a more civilized place is by becoming spiritual counselors, mediators, people who are trained to sit with disputants, people who are engaged in whether it's um, uh, conceptual battles or, or armed conflict or legal battles or whatever, or policy uh, differences, and facilitate the discussion, not taking a position. Now, hear me out on this. This is, this is critically important, really critically important, and it goes to the whole heart of Srila Prabhupada's movement. We have our beliefs. We have our truths. But our worship of Krishna, that's our own internal business. Our role in the world that Prabhupada came to establish was stepping outside the certitude of those convictions long enough to be able to listen to what's going on between other people and find a way to establish common ground so that there will be fertile environments for introducing what we have to offer. You, you, can't, you can't try to proselytize uh, Bhagavad Gita to someone whose stomach is growling because they're starving hungry. You can't talk about Srinath Bhagavatam um, uh, to uh, people who are at war with their uh, neighboring uh, countries. You, you can't introduce Krishna consciousness in a situation where people are struggling so hard just to put food on the table to pay their bills. We have to recognize that there is a priority to things. There's a sequence to how things can be done. So the answer that I have, the best answer I can give you to your question is that everyone involved in Krishna consciousness should, first of all, get therapy because <laughs> they should know, why are you here? <laughs> and secondly, they should take mediation training so that we can become the arbiters of a mutually agreeable outcome for others who are in situations of dispute. Why is that important? Because for, for Prabhupada's mission to be successful, people have to start asking us, what do you think? I see how effectively you've managed to resolve this issue between these people. You must know something. What do you think? Now you have permission. Now you've earned their trust. You've earned the opportunity 
to present Krishna consciousness. There's a difference between shoving it down their throats and people being so impressed with, by what devotees are capable of doing that they voluntarily ask, what's your perspective on this? Now we're making some progress. We get to that point, we're making some real strides. Beautiful. So, you know, I also felt this constantly that there is, uh, there are some people who, as you said, will, get, will be will be willing and receptive to say, taking up Krishna consciousness, if you may use it, uh, like a, and become a member of the movement. I mean, take it as a full program, but the number is not likely to be huge. So if we want to expand our influence, that means what you're saying is where people are, we need to show that you know, we can add value to the to where where you are and then it is so when we are talking about conflict resolution as an example which you are taking so this could be based on devotees being in the mode of goodness broadly speaking because of the practice of bhakti as well as by some specific training and then we bring something valuable something distinctive so to the extent we address people's existing issues in a way uh, that uh, at one thing their issues they they are able to not that we offer them a solution but they are able to come to a solution and they recognize that we played a role in doing that so what is it that makes you tick you know how are you able to play that role yes so yes. that's what will attract absolutely so now but that's yeah, please continue. If I, if I may just play a devil's advocate over here. In one sense, the world's problems are endless. And in Prabhupada, there is that famous discussion between Prabhupada and Bhaktisiddhanta Sri Thakur. When India was in the midst of a significant political ferment uh, in 1921, when he first met him, the Indian independence movement was quite... Uh, that was one of the peaks, 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. There are three peaks in the Indian independence movement. And 1940s eventually led to the independence. So the early 1920s, so Bhakti Sutakur said that you know, Krishna consciousness is the urgency. Everything else can wait. And Prabhupada himself, on many occasions, didn't seem say too much in favor of... Uh, humanitarian outreach. In fact, that like in principle, what you say is right, that you cannot teach a hungry person. A hungry person needs, their hunger has to be taken care of before, before they will be ready to receive Bhagavad Gita knowledge. But at the same time, once as devotees, we start getting entering into these fields. And those fields are themselves endless and they're endlessly complex. And uh, in one sense, problems in the material world are also endless. So it's very easy to get lost in solving problems at the material level itself. Yeah, and well, that's a big mistake. That's a big mistake. Sri the Prabhupada was not against that outreach into the issues of society. It's that he had his priorities. He had to establish priorities. So he didn't want people trying to do those kind of more sophisticated services prematurely. You, you, if, you're, if you're not prepared, you're just going to fall down and hurt yourself and, and, and make things worse. But it's not at all that he was against us making inroads into those deeper levels of, of social involvement. Look, you know, Prabhu, there are things that are almost, how to say this, taboo. There, there are these subjects that are taboo in this country. One of the subjects that's taboo is our attitude toward the LGBTQ community. It's almost a taboo topic. Another topic that uh, people feel very awkward about is um, women gurus. Uh, the, another topic that people are feeling very, very awkward about is uh, uh, abortion. You know, I'll come right out and say this. I am pro-life and I am also pro-choice. I do not believe that you get people to change their, their behavior by legislating that they must change their behavior or else they're going to be thrown in prison or their businesses are going to be blown up. I think that's the kind of 
a totalitarian government that Krishna consciousness is attempting to dismantle. You, you get people to change their ways by offering them compelling arguments, by being compassionate and understanding of their situation and being flexible. So there are taboo topics here. And, and, and um, some of these taboo topics include the, a willingness to embrace the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if you will, incremental change as having value. You know, we want sweeping reform. It's not going to happen. Incremental change means a willingness to be flexible. I don't know if we have, I've ever given you this example. Um, if I have, I apologize for repeating myself, but I used to have an office in the Empire State Building. And I was on the 52nd floor. And in a strong wind, we used to actually feel the building move. You'd feel the building swaying. And someone told me it swayed like a foot and a half or two feet in any direction. That was intentionally built into the architectural plans and the construction materials by the original designers because they knew at that height, if the, the, the steel amalgam that was uh, holding up the building was too rigid in a strong wind, it would snap and the building would collapse. Societies are like that. Cultures are like that. If they're too rigid, they're going to snap. There has to be a degree of flexibility in order to allow for growth to happen. And, and we're not always willing to acknowledge that because it means taking intermediary positions that appeal like we're compromising our own principles. They're not compromising our principles. They're steps toward implementing our principles. But that takes some maturity, how to do that. You know, this is uh, a very... What shall I say? This is a very, you, take, you often take some radical positions, but I, especially with respect to all these topics you discussed, I know politically they are hot potatoes and more than hot potatoes in, in the West. Somehow those are not mainstream discussions in India, but um, you know, maybe we could, uh, we could discuss these separately also, but at the, uh, I think what you said about the point that, you know, abortion is not just an ethical issue. It is also a sociological issue. And uh, it's the way the polarization has come about is that if you are pro-choice, then it's like you hate babies. And if you are pro-life, then it's like you hate women. And the reality is much, much more nuanced than that. So, the, so I, I mean, I'm open to having the, that, those kind of discussions specifically but what you what i if i understand right the point you are making is that uh, that prabhupad actually wanted in the initial stages he wanted us to ground ourselves in the spiritual fundamentals but eventually he wanted us to get involved at a deeper level with social issues so can you give some examples of of prabhupad actually either exhibiting this kind of nuanced engagement with contemporary issues um, or any other quotes or anecdotes. The one thing that, I mean, I'll start if you don't mind. One thing I found really quite eye-opening was reading Prabhupada's discussion on Darwin, the unedited discussion in Veda base, as compared to what we get in Life Comes From Life or what we get in uh, some, some what we hear some sound bites in many of our classes actually in that you it's a long discussion and Prabhupada is not dismissing evolution entirely whenever there is some evidence being presented Prabhupada is actually making a, uh, uh, making a, a attempts to explain that evidence within the framework of the Vedic worldview so that is one example and of course in some ways, trying to trying to nuance our position on evolution is also seen as selling out. In some ways, so that that is also a topic. But are there any other exa any examples you would like to give? Of, sure, uh, I mean, there's, there's there's hundreds of examples of how Prabhupada was 
um, involved with the affairs of the world. It's, uh, it was every day he was addressing those issues. Um, in Geneva, I remember a, a gentleman coming from the um, International Labor Organization, which was a division of the United Nations that had its headquarters in Geneva. The ILO was founded after World War II in an effort to create uh, a more equitable uh, workplace environment and to establish proper trade with uh, neighboring nations. So uh, the man walked in the door and the first thing the Prabhupada said was, um, people want the best goods at the best price. So why should there not be free trade? I'm thinking, where, <laughs> where, where is this coming from? He's, he didn't say Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. We surrender to him. He's saying, no, people want the best goods. If, if this nation can create, if Germany can create, Switzerland can create, why not allow free trade? So this was long before the kind of tariffs that we're seeing implemented now where, you know, there are these, at least the last administration was trying to establish all kinds of uh, restrictive uh, taxes and so on on goods coming in. Anyway. So, so you're saying Prabhupada made the statement huh? that people want the best goods yes. at the best prices. Sure. You know, it, look, he was a very practical person. Our Prabhupada was always a very practical person. Um, I brought him a book on uh, uh, a, by a paleontologist um, uh, by, uh, named Desmond Morris. I, had, I had recently read a book called The Naked Ape. And then this book, um, Morris argues that humans are actually nothing but sophisticated animals. Mm. Everything we do is a... You mentioned uh, that in our earlier podcast. And Prabhupada, yeah. Prabhupada appreciated that point. That yeah, he said, he's, he's correct. He's right. Use that book. <laughs> he's very appreciative. Uh, so far as, you know, um, evolution, there's descriptions of the um, chronological uh, appearance of species in Second Canto Bhagavatam perfectly conforming with uh, some of the concepts that we have in, in uh, the, the, the Darwinian ideas of um, uh, the, the development of species through uh, uh, natural selection and survival of the fittest and so on. Prabhupada's point was, no, the appearance is the same. You know, the deeper principle, as you said a moment ago, is that it's, these are housings for souls evolving up the chain until they reach human life. So he, he did not dismiss, this is the difference. Prabhupada had no problem with science. This is such a big mistake. Prabhupada was quite impressed with what science can do. His spiritual master engaged uh, science and technology in ways that had never happened before. He rode in cars, he wore watches, he senses disciples to Europe uh, by boats, he did think. Prabhupada came, uh, he was ready to use everything in Krishna's service. He traveled by airplane all over the world, and you name it, you know. Uh, so he I had no problem. Pause, if I may just pause, uh, can yeah. I just pause? You know, there yes. is this principle of Yukta Vairagya, which is very much there in our tradition of engaged renunciation. And with respect to practical resources, there is no denying that Prabhupada was very, not only open, but you could say even very, very progressive or very resourceful in terms of, say, using uh, whatever, like air travel for traveling or other things like that. But it's one thing to use the, say, you could say the products of, uh, products of science and technology, but it's quite another thing to use uh, use contemporarily developed intellectual positions. Now, it seems if we look at say books like Dialectic Spiritualism, where Prabhupada is engaging with some philosophers, some Western philosophers, uh, you know, Prabhupada doesn't really go deep into those discussions with those philosophers. Those well, philosophers they, that, you know, that, that book, I, I have my problems with that book. It, it was set up from the outset as a kind of uh, us and them uh, polemic, where uh, certain portions of philosophers' ideas were presented to Srila Prabhupada, usually in an imperfect and incomplete way. And Srila Prabhupada 
knew that he was being expected to respond with, well, the Ved this is what's wrong with that. This is the why the Vedic perspective is better, or that part's okay, but this part is wrong. It, it wasn't um, a reason, it, it wasn't undertaken in the form of what you're asking about, which is uh, the engagement between Krishna consciousness and issues of our day. And was Srila Prabhupada, is that our business? I mean, what you're asking basically is, is it our business? Did Srila Prabhupada in some way exemplify engagement with the issues of the world on these uh, levels other than to the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita? Am I understanding you correctly? Yes. You know, I'm just trying to, uh, yeah, did Prabhupada exemplify, are there precedents of either Prabhupada doing or encouraging you can say that detailed, nuanced engagement with world with world issue. Yeah. The, 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 is, question, the yeah. question is sincere, Prabhu, but it's misplaced, if you'll excuse me. Okay. The, the, is, value, the value of policy in Krishna consciousness is not whether Prabhupada did it. If, if it were up to only we do things that if Prabhupada did it, we, would, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. His whole purpose, his whole message to us was, now take what I've given you and go farther with it. Now go out there and, and, and do something with what I've given you. He used to say, what good is it being an American if you can't come up with some great new ideas? You know? He didn't want us to be uh, mechanical um, robots just doing what he did. That's a big mistake. That that That... First of all, in logic, it's a fallacy. You know, it's it's appeal to authority, and and it, it it's a, it's an imperfect justification for action. Well, Prabhupada never did it. Prabhupada didn't do a lot of things. He was focusing on on concepts and basics, and you and you want to judge, you want to limit his mission to just the things that he he had the time and the capacity to do. How foolish you are! You've missed his, the whole point of his mission. The whole point of his mission was to challenge you to go further. And you're refusing to do it on the pretext, well, Prabhupada never did it. How foolish. Shame on you. For that. I'm not talking about you. I'm saying there's <laughs> someone who takes that position. Um, they're defeating Prabhupada's mission. They're not helping it. You know, Prabhu, probably among all the discussions we have had, you are challenging existing conceptions of Krishna consciousness most in this podcast. A lot of uh, what would we consider the bulwarks of what Krishna consciousness is. Uh, you are challenging those. And I'm happy to have this discussion, but maybe this is probably the most foundational uh, among... Uh, so... But what, is, what are they going to do? Take away my neck piece? No, they're not that they're going to take away. I'm just saying that it's important that we have this discussion. So there is one side which says we are to be faithful to Prabhupada, but what you're saying is we, we are faithful, you could say in spirit of taking Krishna consciousness to various areas, but just because Prabhupada did not take Krishna consciousness to those areas, doesn't mean that we can't take them there. So, no, it, of course, if your faithfulness is so fundamental, fundamentalist, so literalist, that your faith is only to do what Prabhupada did, well, okay. That, that's your prerogative. Go, go, go practice your Krishna consciousness in that way. His movement won't advance like that, but God bless you. Go, go, go and do what, what makes you comfortable. I think, I think those who have a deeper appreciation for Prabhupada's mission will have a, a different position on things. Hmm. Now, this is where, if, uh, say, I may address concerns. Now, I, I, there is. Uh, one senior devotee in our movement who's writing a book on abortion and uh, sound arguments, but it is more like a, it's a morally open and shut case. So now when, uh, when, when I try to present, you know, I, I, at one time I was thinking of writing a whole book on this topic. It was about 10 years ago. Then I realized how, how, it's not just a logical issue. It's a sociological issue. And without addressing the various other aspects, just like giving out a moral edict. 
uh, in one way in some ways when some somebody would have idea write a article or write a book it is in one sense their idea is like find more intellectual justification for the party line if i may put it in slightly provocative terms but sometimes what happens is when we start going deeper into a discussion then we start realizing that you know what we thought was like a certain truth that this is what it is this is what we have to arrive at maybe that truth is not that certain from not just from a ethical perspective but from even from the perspective of what should be the stand of our tradition what would be the stand of our stand based on our tradition so this uh, lack of certitude or rather in one sense uh, deeper intellectual examination of issues in one sense doesn't lead to greater certainty maybe it leads to greater ambiguity uncertainty, uncertainty. now yes. in some ways and that's good and, and okay that's good that's a point i was going to make so in some people will immediately say this this is just uh, you have become contaminated by the by the ideas of demoniac mundane scholars or whatever so some people will see it as a compromise but others would see it as more as you could say humility that the world is not as simple as we thought it was and we need humility in uh, how we can be of any service to the world with the resources of our tradition so if i understand you you would you consider uncertainty not a sign of uncertainty about certain issues not as a sign of uh, compromise necessary compromise or lack of faithfulness or lack of faith in the tradition the uncertainty is healthy you know what prabhupad brought was not um religious dogmatic absolutism carved in 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 tablets and handed down from a mountain top what prabhupad presented was a tool of observation and analysis by which we can filter all of the experiences of our life and the world around us through the lens of the spiritual journey of the soul to god wow prabhu this is and, amazing and 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 the notion that there's one right way to interpret that only one right look i'm willing to admit that there are cultural differences there may be places where rape incest abuse uh, are considered you know just uh, the world going about its business and uh, if somebody rapes your mother or abuses your sister or 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 rapes your daughter well that's that's the culture and and you know uh you know uh, that's their karma and uh yes she may be my mother she may be my sister she may be my wife but uh, that's their karma and and uh, they should have the baby and and then and, and live out their karmic reaction and and uh, if they want to they want to live like that uh, you know uh, okay i i find it heinous i i find it despicable myself but uh, there may be people who want to think like that and and you know what maybe their reaction is in the next life they'll be born as a woman as somebody's mother wife sister daughter and they'll get raped and they'll get murdered and then let them see how they feel about it for myself i i cannot accept this kind of uh i will call it stupid uh, i will call it uh prejudicial short-sighted and ultimately cruel misrepresentation of prabhupad's teachings as somehow you know the true uh, path to god i i i find that absolutely outrageous and i i would encourage people who do not agree with such positions if that's what's prominent in their particular community leave the community i'll go out on a limb and i'll say that rather than living in duplicity and dishonesty that you feel one way but what you see around you is going the other way why live like that move away practice your krishna consciousness in an environment that's healthy for you why should you be a, a, a obliged to go along with something you don't agree with i never heard prabhupada ever espouse that position you know 
chant Hare Krishna or die. I mean, what is that? It's, you know, it, it's tragic, Prabhu, that we're 65 years into uh, our growth as a society. And as far as I'm concerned, we're living in the dark ages about very basic issues that should have been um, established a long, long time ago. Now, I know they're complicated. I, I'm, I'm not being, uh, you know, uh, big-headed about it and, and saying that there's only only one way to see these things. I know that there's many ways to see them. But I believe okay. that there is also a level-headed, respectful way of allowing room for diversity of opinion, diversity of understandings, that should be possible with, without, without ostracizing someone. If someone has a different point of view, I'm not talking about different from my point of view. I'm not talking about everyone should believe the way I do. I'm saying if someone has a different point of view from mine, okay. I've been in environments where I was invited to be part of a committee, for example, an executive committee. And there were things being said. I said, oh my God, this is so stupid. I can't, I can't stand this. This is so, uh, 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 you know, people with blinders on. They're just unwilling to. I, so I resigned. I tended my resignation. I stepped away. I didn't want to create waves. I don't want to be, you know, someone to rock the boat. Let, let them do what they want to do. But I don't want to be a part of it. I left temple life for that same reason. I'm not proud of leaving Temple Life, but I am proud of having had the common sense to know that if I stay here, I'm going to die. If I, if I continue on in this environment, I'm going to shrivel up and just you know blow away in the next breeze. In order to be a good, better devotee, I have to step away from this environment. I've got to put myself in a healthier place where I can start exercising my Krishna consciousness, as I know my spiritual master wanted me to, without these moral, ethical, and, 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 and spiritual conundra constantly um, you know, causing me anxiety and stress and tension, and, and I'm going to lose all faith. Stay in that kind of an unhealthy environment and just be prepared to bloop. We used to call it blooping. Just be prepared to go away permanently. Well, don't risk that. that, that that's tragic on a grand scale. Thank you for sharing that so candidly, Prabhu. So if I understand right, you started with things like, say, rape, incest, incest and abuse. So I thought what you were talking about is uh, moral relativism. Because you said there are cultural differences. So sure. what you are trying to say at one level is that we don't endorse moral relativism entirely. But it is better to have, have an environment where there is diversity rather than to, to live in an environment where is, there is moral absolutism and where, say, you could say our, our bhakti and our even humanity may shrivel because we constantly have to accept things that we find unacceptable. Was that the link between your points? Yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, again, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, incremental change. I, I, okay. I, I, I volunteered to write a code of ethical behavior for ISCOM, which is up before the GBC, and I hope they approve it. But in order to get it approved, I had to change almost every one of the uh, uh, articles that I had written. In large measure, because I was told, you know, this is too much, you're asking for too much, cut back on that. Don't say that we agree as a society to respect everyone, uh, and uh, uh, embrace everyone regardless of their uh, sexual orientation, sexual preference, sexuality, sex, gender. You can't say all of that uh, because there are places, and this is a legitimate concern, certain countries in Africa and elsewhere where homosexuality is illegal. You can be prosecuted for being a member of the LGBTQ community. Okay, well, that's one concern. The other concern is places where culturally, it's not acceptable. All right. I didn't like it, but I accepted. Okay, let's get something established. Let's have some code of ethical behavior. And then over the course of time, we can make 
amendments, we can make improvements. Maybe we, us first generation devotees have to all die out first of all before it happens. And the next generations will have a more enlightened, informed position on these issues. So I, I know that things take time. It's hard for me, maybe because I'm getting older and I, I want to see things happen before I go. But um, I, I have faith in Prabhupada's movement. I have faith in what he did. I believe that inherent in what he presented us, there is a self-correcting mechanism. No matter how badly we try to mess it up, eventually it will rectify. It will find that middle road, that's that solid path, and eventually it'll we'll get to where we need to be. So this topic of ethical behavior for for our movement or for some some kind of guidelines for devotees. This I have seen that. There is a lot of absolutism that is assumed to be the default conclusion of scriptures. Whereas the actually it, it can be very nuanced. So I think this would be a very, very helpful if we have something like this. And I would say maybe this is also an example of, uh, of a more... Uh, nuanced engagement with uh, current issues okay, that that are in the outside outside world are also they are confronted by devotees who are in the world today who, who are functioning in the world and uh, just tracing back maybe one or two points and we will conclude or we'll continue for differ for the next session so when you, you made the point that uh, Prabhupada that there, there, there are some devotees who may think that following Prabhupada faithfully means only doing the things that he did and not doing anything else. So uh, in contrast with uh, we, 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 we see a need that we see a contemporary social issue and then we develop the resources to deal with that issue in an appropriately sophisticated or nuanced way. So we can we maybe we can look back in the tradition because in one sense Prabhupada was with us for a very short time and uh, Prabhupada was basically laying the groundworks for the movement uh, the we could say the the groundwork for the movement not that he gave he he for example during Prabhupada's time there were no zoom talks there were no technology available like that so Prabhupada laid the groundwork and we will have to be maybe intellectually improvising not just technologically improvising so maybe Bhaktivinoda Thakur could be an example of a more nuanced engagement because he doesn't, he's not that dismissive about various schools of thought like in Tattva Vivek and some of his other books. He actually engages with, uh, engages with, uh, with Western, Western schools of thought, at least to some extent. So I'm just saying that, you know, going beyond what Prabhupada has done, uh, are there any or say engaging in a nuanced way with social issues. Are there any examples of precedents that we could cite for that purpose? Because if we go before Bhaktivinoda Thakur, I think the, the we, were, we are practically in the medieval times and we don't have much record of devotees' writings or engagement on social issues at all. We have only their devotional writings being preserved. So any thoughts on this, Prabhu? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Okay, uh, so can you, okay, you phrase it. Yeah, more a different like way? a more intellectually nuanced engagement with contemporary issues. Hmm? You said that Prabhupada didn't necessarily do that model, model that in a very detailed way. So, uh, Prabhupada, you gave examples of Prabhupada giving surprising responses, uh, which were contrary to the we could say the mainstream narrative of what Prabhupada's position would be. With respect to, say, uh, the, the with some certain issues like that, Darwinian takes on, right. on on nature, but for that kind of engagement, are there any precedents in our tradition, or are there any? Is there any foundation for doing that, without that being seen as leading to compromise and relativism? Right. Look. Um... 
Prabhupada's concern was that we were going to go too far with this. You know, I, I've, I've come, first of all, the answer to you is yes. You read Krishna Samhita and some other works by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and you'll see a more nuanced intellectual engagement with issues such as evolution and uh, historic time frames. Yes. Um, Prabhupada was uh, concerned that liberals like me uh, would take things too far. So he, he laid down a rather conservative view most of the time. And that's understandable. You know, a, a guy like me um, wants to stretch the envelope sometimes dangerously far. And we need to be, you know, uh, roped in. We need to be uh, uh, limited in how much damage we can do. I, I know that. I recognize that. But I also recognize at the same time that the conservatives, whom I have come to respect in my old age, um, are also limited. You know, their job is to protect the tradition. The role of the conservatives is to say, this is how it's been. This is what our foundational ideas are. And no one should be allowed to tamper with that. And that's vitally important. We, we can't afford to, to lose the, the integrity of the core of our tradition. So their job is to protect that core, to uh, 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 promote best practices and so on. But because that's their job, you can't also expect them to be the source of innovation. You look at the history of religious traditions and communities, the innovations never came from the clergy. They always came from the laity. They always came from the, the congregants, the people who had the flexibility to go out and say, here's how we can bring our contribution to the larger public. And by the way, there, I don't know a religious community in the world today that is not going through this same exercise that you and I are talking about here. The Buddhist community is looking how it should be engaged in the world. The Christian community is looking how it should. Only recently, in the last 10 years, Christian, uh, the Christian community has embraced the environmentalism. Just in the last few years. Yeah. Jewish culture, they've always kind of been involved with the world. That's, that's something else. But uh, Islam is also asking, you know, there is a progressive wing, if you will, within each of these religious traditions. And they're all asking the same question. How do we get our message out to uh, people who are not a member of our, of our inner core? How do we express ourselves and who we are in the larger world? So it's, it's going on everywhere. So Prabhupada took that stricter position precisely because he knew that we were a bunch of dancing monkeys and, and we were gonna have a tendency to, to misappropriate his teachings for our own purposes. And he wanted to protect the Bible. Every page in every one of his books says, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God, is, you're not the body, devotional service, every page of every book. Why? Because he knew these knuckleheads, they're gonna take everything I'm giving them, they're gonna twist it up and they're gonna come out with some strange thing and call it Krishna consciousness. So he, but that was the foundation. That wasn't, that wasn't the ultimate vision of what things should look like. You know, when you're a child, your parents take you in hand, you know, mm -hmm. oh, you've been naughty. Go to your room and sit there and think about what you did. <laughs> but that's not supposed to be what you live by the, the rest of your life. You mature, you get wiser. You get more experience, and then you can start making a greater contribution. I don't know why this, this pathological fear of growing in Prabhupada's mission and making these greater contributions. I don't understand. I think you, you touched that half that there is a fear of going too far, but it's like in the fear of not going too far, we are actually going nowhere. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> you, you, you have a way of summarizing things. You, you've got a gift. <laughs> Thank you. <man. laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate the point you made that you you respect the conservatives, but yeah, in the in the clergy, it's true that the clergy is the laity. You could say that I can use that word. That that's it. Uh, that's that's who actually, in one sense, needs the needs the innovations the most because the clergy is more or less living in a you could say in a in a more cloistered environment 
where they don't have to interact with the world so much so some yeah. of my best friends are you know sanyasi gbc fundamentalist fuddy daddy i love them anyway <laughs> oh god so actually it helps in one sense as you said to place the challenges of our movement in the broader context of the challenges that every tradition is facing yes and, of course you now i was reading about how buddhism spread in the west let us maybe conclude with the, your your feedback on this so it seems that when the lai lama started becoming uh, popular in the west hmm, he had written several books and he had taken because he was primarily guiding monasteries and things like that in in tibet and other places so he had taken quite absolutist positions on several issues like homosexuality and then his books were published in the west those things were systematically of course he was alive so things were edited out of his books when they were republished in the west so i think what you said about cultural differences also cu- cultures make a difference in what can be said where so do i think this is a if you would like to respond to that then i'll try to summarize we set the scene for a future discussion this was all very important mm. my my experience has been that most of the people will take these kind of hard line fundamentalist positions about what is the right way in krishna consciousness uh, our newbies who never met prabhupad never spent one moment with him in their whole life and and those of us who had the privilege of spending a lot of time with him so a different kind of approach to things Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't begrudge people their, you know, elementary, cautious, safe. Call it what you like. You know, they 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 may be concerned or afraid of of risks of of stretching things too far. I'm dealing with these people, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. I'm dealing with them almost every day, and you know, I. some of them you know you're not going to be able to change their mind the, the best you can do is offer a different perspective and um and and try to live your life according to your own moral ethical and and spiritual compass um and again I, my my faith in prabhupad is unshakable i think that we will see our way out of the clouds because what he did uh is in itself curative there there's a there's an internal mechanism that will eventually guide us to the right path so i i don't despair i i roll my head sometimes my eyes i can't believe what's going on but i don't despair thank you bro yeah it's a, i think it's a very realistic as well as optimistic way you have presented it that you know ultimately you said earlier there's a self correcting mechanism and still krishna is in charge of the movement yes thank you so you know i thought over i'll try to summarize but one thing that struck me which could be a key point that is there one right way to be krishna conscious and that itself that there can be many ways of being krishna conscious i think that comes through maturity to experiencing devotees practicing bhakti in different context different backgrounds and just coming to know of, about the challenges of living in the real world and dealing with real issues so so i mean, i'll try to summarize and so we started today by discussing primarily about say western culture and then you talked about how the basic premise of western culture was that you know how could people be provided engagements how could they pursue their self interest with uh, without a tyrannical form of government while well, giving them a level playing field was so that is one of the signal contributions or at that is the aspirations of the west and uh, then we discussed about indian perceptions of western culture briefly and how there was a two separate issues and the major theme that we explored deeper was that if we are to make a contribution to mainstream society it will not be in terms of of say giving uh, giving straightforward moral directives like say ban all slaughterhouses 
or just that or simply simple a simple spiritual truth you are not the body or the soul but actually we'll have to engage with the current issues and understand those issues so that we earn a place of respect in the dialogue uh, in the main stand one way one example you gave for this was that devotees could become mediators or conflict resolvers based on whatever goodness we have cultivated by the practice of our bhakti and based on acquiring certain certain of those skills and then when we offer something of value to people where they need it then they will become more open to to what we are trying to offer them what we, what we as a tradition have distinct to offer and then we discussed how certainties are actually you said something that prabhupa did not come to give like a set of moral absolutist dogmas uh, inscribed in stone he gave more a process of uh, tools for analyzing and experiencing our individual journey the journey of the soul through life and you know that that is a beautiful thought so if we take the second premise sec- uh, second principle that prabhupada gave us tools for analyzing and experiencing life from a spiritual perspective then that means that the different devotees may have different positions on these issues and we as we in our movement itself have a lot of challenges in implementing spiritual truths in actually institutional or social contexts so we need a lot of work one one possibility of work could be ethical uh, providing some ethical framework ethical gui- ethical policy for devotees or the ethical guidelines for devotees and then another you said is that if, if as devotees we are in an environment maybe a community or environment where we find certain ap- moral absolutes unacceptable to us then we need to step out otherwise we will we in the name of conformity we may end up losing our faith so when we talk about to think that following prabhu path faithfully means doing only the things that prabhu path did that is a that is a user is a too simplistic an understanding of what being faithful means and prabhu path so prabhu path because we were we were when he was there with us devotees were relatively young so it was more like a childhood phase so that's when prabhupada was very protective and prabhupada didn't want us to stray too far away but prabhupada also wanted us to push forward krishna consciousness in whatever way as possible for us and we saw some examples of say intellectual resourcefulness in bhakti no thakur you mentioned krishna samhita and some of the other books so the important thing is that uh, we you talk about twice two three times about incremental slow change and uh, that movement from certainty to uncertainty is not necessarily a moral compromise it could also be we it could also be a growth in maturity or humility so if we so rather than presuming that there's one right way to be krishna conscious we need to actually understand issues and then devotees more at an individual level at as is like a not not that the level of the institutional authorities but at individual level like you know innovation and resourcefulness comes from the more from the laity than the clergy so that's how we will be able to address these issues in the future and uh, there is always hope there should not be despair because ultimately what prabhupada has given us contains the self correcting mechanism and uh, that's how we can move ahead so would you like to add anything i mean it was a, it was a very i think this was one of the most uh, you could say wide ranging discussions we had till now and uh, we did uh, we have a you could say we have a lot to discuss in future too <laughs> uh, something i would maybe in closing i would just say don't don't hate anybody because they have a different opinion from yours don't don't despise someone because they're they're look we're all victims of kali yuga here you know this is a terrible time people are brought up with parents who haven't a clue what their spiritual identity is they have no idea how to be good parents 
young people grow up with all kinds of traumas and sadnesses in their lives. And those things translate into attitudes, behaviors, beliefs, policies, ways of thinking. Okay, I don't agree with a lot of them, maybe. I, we, we ha- as Vaishnavas, we have to at least try to be sensitive to why they came to those positions. And un- unless it's abusive, I mean, if someone's beating you up, don't, don't stick around saying, well, let me try to understand them. Get out, <laughs> move away from that. But apart from those extreme circumstances, uh, we are called upon by our faith to love others, to appreciate others, and to find a middle ground for living together in Krishna consciousness. Now, I believe in mediation. I believe in therapy. I believe in having that uh, neutral third voice as a way to get there. But um, I guess my point is Try, try, try to never have anything other than compassion for other people, no matter how mixed up they may be. You know, everyone is dealing with their own stuff in their own way. And, and um, we, we have to, I'm talking to myself here, really. You know, we have to understand why they think the way they do, why they believe the way they do. And even though I may disagree with them dramatically, um, I still should not lose my respect for them or my uh, appreciation that they're also in, in their way trying to be good followers of Srila Prabhupada. So there it is. Thank you, bro. I think that's a that polarization that you started mentioning like earlier, Democrats and uh, Republicans could sit and take lunch together. I think that polarization is in our movement also more and more between devotees from different backgrounds. So yeah. It's tragic. Yeah. Don't hate anyone because of mm. because they have opinion different from ours. Sometimes it seems the polarization becomes more within religious communities because each side believes that they are actually uh, they are carrying on a sacred man, sac- sacred mandate. And they have the right to they are right and they have the right to protect others, protect everyone from those who are wrong. So it becomes no. it becomes even worse sometimes. You know what the uh, the Wehrmacht, the German Nazi army, had stamped on their on their belt buckles, "God mit uns," hmm. God is with us. Really? Oh. I didn't know that. My God! <laughs> <laughs> oh, be careful. That's be careful. Very, yeah, be careful. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Boys to Shri Prabhupada. Jai Shri Prabhupada.